Our next artist was really hot. In fact, he was really hot. <sighs> With his well-tailored suits and deep down dirty soul voice, you could say that he was the ultimate 80s ladies man. Taught me everything I know. <laughs> Don't criticize. Very physical, very sweaty performer, very masculine performer. Don't criticize my friends. He was up there just sweating and didn't care. He wasn't trying to look pretty, wasn't trying to do nothing. Yeah, like, like the old soul singers used to yeah. do. They sweat. James mm. Brown, they sweat. They just, ugh, just, just nasty. Are you ready out there? I'm not going to not wear my suit because it's hot. I'm not going to go out there in a jumping suit or a jogger suit because people come to see a show. They don't want to see somebody who looks just like them. You know, they come to see a show. If success is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration, then walking testosterone gland love god, Alexander O'Neill, became its 80s soul epitome. O'Neill's is a tale not just of sweat, but of sex, drugs, and excess. It began in Minneapolis when he almost joined Prince's band at the time. The deal fell through after they fell out, but he'd made friends in the band who were to become legendary 80s producers. Alex, he just was left around town playing local gigs for quite a while after that. But we always vowed, whenever we got ourselves solid, we were gonna come back and do something with him. I gave myself a time frame of five years. I said, if, I'm not, if I haven't made it in five years, I'm gonna go start driving big lorry trucks across the country, you know what I'm saying? You find something to talk about? Thankfully, with a year to spare, his old buddies helped him escape a life on the road of Yorkies and jazz mags. Their songs and production made him an international star with a platinum album and a string of hit singles. Alex was nothing without their material. I mean, they wrote songs that defined Alexander O'Neill. They really provided the musical foundation um, they recognized, obviously they knew him, they'd known him for years, and they recognized his vocal skills. Can I get some nasty bass? But the whole O'Neill package was nothing without image. Credit for that goes to a secret Southern style guru. I'll never forget a guy told me from Mississippi when I was working, he said, Ellis, son, let me tell you something, boy. If you slick your hair back and put you some tall boots on, You'll be a star. His hair had been slicked down. He was wearing these light suits. He looked like a black American football version of Frank Sinatra. He'd come in dressed as a crooner, and he got on stage, and he sweated up a storm, and you really knew that you were in the presence of a, of a serious soul man, serious sex god. This man sang from a genuine soul tradition. His perception of the sort of the soul man or the R&B singer would even work today because I think that working women of the world want to be treated a certain way. They want men to respect them and they want a certain amount of romance. That's all Alex gave them was respect and romance. Yeah, right. And that would mean a shag in front of 10,000 people then. The bed scene was to derive, it was intended to be fun, kind of funny. I just got bold, you know, I was like, okay, you know, acting like a big baller, you know, big player, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna get a bet, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, you know? And uh, little did I know that the bet would create that much uh, interest. This bed, this bed, this bed to be for me, to be in long, all along. What does he do? Come on, tell everybody well, no, what, what he's doing. Hold on, we'll just get Sally in here. Come on, sit he, uh, beside me. I saw you at Birmingham, and you went down into the audience, and you stole this girl's heart, this poor girl, <laughs> and dragged her back and threw her on her bed on what? The stage. You did. What? <laughs> threw her on her bed on <laughs> stage. Is this true? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> Yes, we've got the point, you horny old dog. So did his army of female fans who seemingly mistook him for Tom Jones. They would throw strange 
things on stage like knickers and, and bras and stuff like that. But I never picked the knickers up because I didn't know where they had been. They just be like knickers coming from in the crowd, you know, and I'm like, if I had a face to go with them, maybe I could identify with something, but... Uh... When you saw Alex on stage and when you saw him uh, giving it up on some of the ballads and then when you saw him raunching about on some of the more up-tempo tunes, you didn't imagine he was going back to his bedroom to read a good book. You are my favorite lady. Quite so, because Alex was living the life of a dedicated trouser terrorist away from the stage. I had a big entourage of guys that went with me, so when you have that kind of thing, it was like everybody was just having fun, and you know, we enjoyed the ladies, and, and, and they enjoyed us. And what would sex and rock and roll be without an outsized drug habit? Drugs is an equal opportunity employer, and it started out as fun. That's the way drugs are, it started out as fun. Then it became recreation, and then it became a job. You don't ever know when you're going to fall off the wagon or fall on. Guess who that's between? You and your God and your own conscience. Although a life of excess took its inevitable toll and his chart fortunes faded, Alex kept gigging and has a new album lined up for release.